I'm Stuart Weinstein from Legal Talk. As you know, we try and talk about the uh, tough issues, violence towards women, wrongful convictions, the pharmaceuticals. We're going to be talking about the whole aspects of different issues. That's the whole goal of Legal Talk, is to talk about issues that need to be talked about, certainly things leading towards the 2012 presidential election. Well, today we're doing some counterfeiting, um, trying to get my uh, income level up. So my feeling is uh, it's time to print my own money. So. Um, it's in the middle of drying, and I'm just getting some more. I've got some different currencies here. Uh, so the goal is, is we're going to be doing a, um, and we'll repeat it again in a second. We want to hear what you have to do. How do you counterfeit, and what is your currency that you prefer? So put together a one-minute video, and uh, try not to get ink on yourself because it, uh, it's hard to get off. Um, so put together a one-minute video and send it into Legal Talk showing what currencies you prefer to, uh, to counterfeit, uh, what techniques you use, the technology, and um, give us your results. What have people uh, done um, in terms of when you've given it off that they haven't seen that uh, it is? Go use it for purchases and everything. Um, once again, um, it's still wet, so I apologize that it's falling off the line. But uh, I know that I owe people some money, and hopefully when they uh, come for it, I'll give them some of this, and they won't know the hey, difference. Hey, Stuart, how are you? Hey, David, good to see you. Good to see you. What's doing? What's doing? Well, I've just been busy. I heard, you, been... Uh, I heard you have some money today, because uh, I was wondering if I get that 50 bucks you owe Yes, yeah, so I, I just actually uh, just, just got it today. Just, uh, it's actually freshly printed. Oh, okay. So um, take what is you Is this going to pass for uh, real? This is real. This is real, this freshly is real. printed. I, I only, I only use maybe that I'll them. I don't really print money now, do this I? This one seems to be talking to me. Okay. Um, maybe I'll grab one of these. Okay, let's try and get that off, off there of for your you. Clothesline. It's good that you're uh, printing money right here in yeah. our studio. That's so pretty said, cool. So you said that I owe you fifty. Well, you know what? Here's here's sixty one. Sixty one. Yeah. So there you go. I nice. want you to feel that I'm giving you back. Um, and I appreciate uh, you, you uh, believing in me. There's a profit built in there. Absolutely. So thank, thank you very, very much. much. Good and, luck uh, with your contest. I'll send well, in my video. Absolutely. Send in the video, and okay. we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. All right. Sounds good. But uh, that's good, though. Have I a good show. It. You too, David. Thanks for the, uh, for the cash. Absolutely. All right. So you see, there's the advantage. I owed him $50. I'm now giving him $61 of fake counterfeit money. He doesn't know the wiser, and, and I'm in a good shape. So everybody wins in this situation. And this is Stuart Weinstein. Coming up on Legal Talk, we have Nikki Thomas from the Sex Professionals of Canada and Ron Marzell, who's going to talk about issues in the whole aspect of uh, hooking prostitution and the classiness of it and the uh, case that's before the Ontario Court of Appeals as well as the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm Stuart Weinstein, and this is Legal Talk. <laughs> Weinstein, welcome back from Legal Talk, and once again, hopefully you're getting your counterfeiting videos going. Today we're being joined by Nikki Thomas from the Sex Professionals of Canada and Ron Marzell, who is going to explain some of the things that are happening in the prostitution laws currently within the Ontario Court of Appeal and perhaps going to the Supreme Court. Welcome both of you to the show. Thank you. So Nikki, could you give a brief introduction of yourself and what do you see as the major problem currently? Okay, my name is Nikki Thomas. I'm the Executive Director of the Sex Professionals of Canada. Mm -hmm. We are a volunteer organization dedicated to the decriminalization of sex work in Canada. And we definitely feel that the biggest problems surrounding sex work are the laws that constrict it and put our safety in danger because we are not, for example, allowed to work indoors, we are not allowed to hire security, and we are not allowed to communicate with each other for the purposes of protecting ourselves. And Ron Marzell, if you could give a brief experience to yourself and where you see uh, some of the issues that are... Sure. So uh, my name is Ron Marzell. I'm a criminal lawyer here in Toronto. I do a lot of um, advocacy on behalf of uh, individualized individuals that are marginalized, like sex workers, um, uh, medical drug users, um, and uh, I, I take a sort of globalistic approach to um, the law and and uh, think that the criminal law is a, is a blunt instrument that shouldn't be used to solve a lot of social issues. There are social issues like prostitution, drug use, that can be better solved with other social programs as opposed to criminalization. 
And just as a, a mention to the audience is that you'll be on in a future episode of Legal Talk talking about decriminalization of drugs. Yes. You're also going to be burning the criminal code, I understand. I, well, we'll see. Okay. There are provisions of the criminal code. <laughs> if you want it to. <laughs> it should be burned. I'll right. bring the matches. You bring the matches. Well, there you go. <laughs> Can you talk about the numbers, the safety, the violence, men versus women? Like, is it just a, a woman's issue? Is it a men's issue? And some of the numbers and some of the money we're dealing with in this industry. Well, I don't know if it's, n it's easy to reduce it to just a women's issue or just a men's issue but the fact is the vast majority of violence against women in the sex trade it comes at the hands of men however there is a misconception that the violence tends to come from clients the truth is the majority of the violence that sex workers experience come either from violent and abusive partners or in some cases pimps who take advantage of the, le le the legal and regulatory void and the fact that sex workers cannot legally hire security and take advantage of that fact to control sex workers who are already marginalized and often in desperate situations. That being said, only about 10 to 15 percent of sex work is conducted at the street level, which in many cases is called survival sex work. However, that tends to be the stereotype that most people think of when they hear the word prostitute or sex worker. So even though only a small percentage of sex workers are experiencing major violence, the threat of violence is always there. So those of us who choose to work in the industry have to go to great lengths to protect ourselves from violence. And the best way to do that is to make clients accountable by collecting information, such as name, phone number, email address, etc. So by doing that, we can deter opportunistic violence against sex workers. And that is what our goal is. When you talk about, just as a clarification, when you talk mm -hmm. about sort of the politically correct, if someone said hooker, is that as sort of classy? Is there certain w words that the industry wants people to talk to you so that it's, it's seen as a respectful? Well, we prefer the term sex worker because okay. it refers to what a person does as opposed to a hooker or prostitute, which is an identity category. So sex work is what I do. I paid my way through school by working in the sex trade. It doesn't make me any less of a person. It's not something that I necessarily take on as part of my identity. But it is a term that refers to the job as opposed to the type of person that you are. So if someone, for example, uh, works in a strip club, mm -hmm. or for example, works in a pornography uh, film, it's mm -hmm. that same idea. It's more like making a living versus who they are, like the, yes. the cameo versus off screen? Well, sex work and the term sex worker was actually coined by a woman named Carol Lee, who was an activist from the Bay Area, San Francisco in the United States. And she came up with the term specifically because there was this really uncertain way of describing those who worked in the sex trade. And because it is, you know, the sex industry, that's why we refer to it as sex work. And sex work is an umbrella term that refers to porn stars, um, phone sex operators, dancers in strip clubs, and prostitutes such as myself. Okay, so in, in Ron, uh, maybe you can sort of talk about the, the court case. It's currently now at the Ontario Court of Appeal. I believe, as a clarification, you were one of the uh, the plaintiffs or defendant for that? Uh, that's not the case, actually. I am the executive director of the Sex Professionals of Canada, okay. and all three of the applicants in the case are members of the organization, okay. and I have been voted the official representative for the organization, but I am not named as an applicant in the actual trial. Okay, and can you talk about the case, Ron, sure. where it is I, and I, where I, it's going? I, I'll happily talk about the case. Just some clarification. Uh, it, although most of the violence that prostitutes face are as a result of domestic partner situations or, or pimps. What uh, I think we need to point out is very few women in Canada operate in a pimp-like situation today. You'd agree with that, I would right? absolutely agree yeah, with yeah. that. So it is a small very, percentage. Very, there's, there's a very small percentage that, that operate um, with a pimp and um, are exposed to that kind of violence. Um, the case is about opportunistic violence and, and trying to prevent, trying to get rid of the criminal code provisions that um, uh, people who want to, who see an opportunity c to commit an act of violence against a prostitute, um, taking that opportunity away by, you know, um, through the use of deterrence. Um, but also what needs to be pointed out is that um, some of the most violent and horrific acts of violence 
that have occurred have occurred at the hands of Johns, which is why it's very, very important that we get rid of these criminal code provisions. You only need to look at Robert Picton's pig farm to okay. see just how horrific it is. And we know that there are predators out there. There are people out there who are just inclined to look for women that are easy targets, that are marginalized, that are on the streets, you know, that a lot of people don't care about, and those predators target those women precisely because they think, you know, given the current legislative context, I can get away with it. Nobody cares about these women. I can target these women. I can kill them. I can, you know, get off on, on, on my sick, perverted fantasies of murdering these women. Um, and I'll, I'll get away with it for a long, long time. And uh, the case is primarily about that. Can you just clarify, like when you talk about a John, is a John a customer? A John is a customer. It's, okay. it's, a client it's is the term that we like to use. So, so once again, it, it's changing the, the way that people refer. It's a client. Mm -hmm. So if someone's a John, it, but it's effectively a client. Mm -hmm. the, the term John is uh, sort of slang in the industry. And the reason for that is because a lot of clients like to remain anonymous. And they will pre refer to themselves as John because so like it's John such a Dunn. common name. However, anybody who contracts a professional for a service, such as someone who contracts an accountant or a lawyer, usually is a client of that professional. So that is how we like to refer to the uh, those that see us for our services. And if I can follow up on what Ron said, Gary Ridgway, who was the worst serial killer in North American history and was suspected of killing as many as 95 prostitutes, specifically said that the reason that he chose prostitutes was because he thought he could kill as many of them as he wanted and never get caught. So the opportunistic aspect is definitely a big concern for us, and that is a large reason uh, why the case has been brought to the Court of Appeal and eventually to the Supreme Court. Now, you're saying eventually, so where are we with the Court of Appeal? And is there an assumption so that whatever side wins or loses, that it's going to the next level? Ab absolutely. Yes. So uh, we won at the, uh, the initial level, at the Superior Court of Justice level. Um, the judge accepted our, our, our arguments in, in totality and struck down. We only targeted three provisions of the criminal code, and I'll get to that momentarily. But the judge accepted that these three provisions of the criminal code contributed um, to the harm or the danger that's faced by prostitutes. What you need to keep in mind is that prostitution in and of itself in this country is not illegal. It's never been illegal. So it's a legal profession. The law says you can exchange money for sex. Yeah, that's fait complete. There's no question that women are entitled to do this. But then you have these three provisions around the criminal code. You actually have lots of provisions around the criminal code regulating this industry, but we only targeted three of them. And I'll give you uh, a couple of examples of uh, regulations that we, we, we don't have issue with. Right? There are provisions in the criminal code that target exploitive behavior uh, by pimps as against pro prostitutes. We don't have an issue with those provisions. We agree with those provisions. Those provisions are necessary, and they should be left in the criminal code. Okay. Women who are in the sex trade should not be abused, should not be coerced. Um, they should not, um, there, there should not be pressure on them to do what they do at the hands of a pimp. So we haven't touched those provisions of the criminal code. Also, underage prostitution, we agree with that. That's an appropriate provision in the criminal code. So there are a whole litany of provisions in the criminal code that we've said, you know, these make sense, and they're important, and they're necessary, and we haven't challenged those. We've left them, and we agree that they should be into the criminal code. So when you say we're going to burn the criminal code... <laughs> <laughs> I'll only bring one match, so. just fine. Well, <laughs> there are only, there's 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 enough there only certain provisions of the criminal code that need to be, you know, um, redacted or, 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 or changed to, be, to come into conformity with, with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So what we've targeted are these three provisions of the criminal code. Um, they are body house, um, living off the avails, and public communication. So um, starting off with body house. A body house is a location where acts of prostitution occur on a regular basis. Okay. Okay. We've said that provision is unconstitutional and impairs women from being able to protect themselves, and I'll get into that momentarily. We've also targeted living off the veil. So it's a criminal offense for anyone other than a prostitute 
to live off the veils, the, the money that comes in from the exchange of sex for money, the money that comes in from prostitution. So anybody, it, it's, it's, it's like a blanket, blanket prohibition that says a prostitute can live off the veils, but anybody else cannot live off the funds of prostitution. Okay. Finally, the last provision of the criminal code that we targeted is public communication. And public communication is you cannot talk uh, in public for the purposes of uh, advancing a, a prostitution transaction. Okay, so you can't do that in public. So what we looked at is we looked at the configuration of these three provisions and basically what it said to us is that number one, women cannot operate indoors. Where it's probably safe, the, the safest way for them to operate. Right? They cannot operate where in a location where they can have video cameras, where they can have panic buttons. It's, it's akin to um, the government saying, you know what, you can be a license to be a bank, but you can't operate indoors with video cameras and with pan panic buttons and security systems. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. How ridiculous is that? So first the government says you cannot have a safe, secure location where you operate out of, where you have all these security measures. So now you're forced onto the street. Okay? okay? Picture this. Now a prostitute is forced onto the street. Well, she's on the street. She can't have a bodyguard with her. She can't have any form of security. She can't have an administration that creates bad date lists because those individuals who would be bodyguarding her or providing the administration like bad, bad date lists, they'd be living off the avails. So what we're saying is that, that the pimp provision, and there are other provisions in the criminal code that we're fine with, that we think are, are fine and necessary and important. However, this one is just too broadly drafted. To say, you know, anybody who lives off the veils of prostitution means that prostitutes cannot have bodyguards, they cannot have administration to help them out, um, to compile all, all the necessary elements that they need to run their business safely. You said there's so, one more as well, there's a third? There's one more, public communication. So now, prostitute can operate indoors, can't have a bodyguard, she's out on the street, okay? What does the criminal law say? at that point in time. No public communication. So when a John rolls up in his car, prostitute has no time to suss out and feel out and, and get comfortable with the John who's in the car. She has to jump in the car right away or commit a criminal offense. It sounds like communication. Going, me going to Best Buy and having to buy a television immediately without going through the, the same idea because it's, it's work related? It's, absolutely. You're not allowed to negotiate with a client. You're not allowed to discuss prices or which services that you're willing to perform. You're not allowed to request any information from the client so as to uh, confirm his identity and make him accountable. And as Ron has outlined, all of these laws make it very difficult for someone such as myself to operate safely. I'm not allowed to work out of my own home. I'm not allowed to work um, with another person. I'm not allowed to communicate my whereabouts to anybody else. I'm not allowed to even hire a webmaster to administer my website or anything to that effect because that person could be considered to be living on the avails. And this is very problematic for those of us who choose to be in the industry and want to do this safely. I will clarify one thing that Ron said is that out calls, which are when the sex worker visit is the visits the client in their location, are legal. But then we don't have, and an, in, to use a term from sports, we don't have any sort of home field advantage. We have <laughs> no understanding of what sort of situation we're getting ourselves into. And I've heard horror stories from other girls in the industry who have visited a client expecting him to be the only one there, and then in the middle of the session, three or four of his friends come out of the closet in the bedroom. Uh -huh. And you can only imagine how that handled. Because it was illegal for that particular sex worker to work in her own environment and in my apartment I have a number of um, I don't want to disclose them publicly but okay. I have a number of different security measures and fallbacks that I can resort to if things go badly I have somebody that I will use for a safe call which is where I inform them of the person that I'm going to be with and I ask them to contact me at a certain point during the session just to make sure that everything is okay but that person is now at risk of being charged with living on the avails and public communication for the purposes of solicitation. So you can understand how these laws are very dangerous for those of us in the business. So as a, as a, a wrap up in terms of the next three episodes, we, we plan Legal Talk wants to follow this between the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. Where would you say sort of the next episodes or where would you say the focus should be as a, as a uh, brief wrap up as to uh, where, 
we, we should go from here? I think that it would be worthwhile to start discussing potential regulatory systems and licensing because we do feel that at some point the the Supreme Court of Canada is going to uphold Justice Himmel's decision and then there will be a discussion between the federal government and the municipalities who are responsible for licensing and for regulation as to exactly how they would like to see sex work conducted in their jurisdictions. And we do respect certain concerns from community organizations who don't want to see sex workers lining up in front of schoolyards and things like that and that's not going to happen. The, the whole sky is falling sort of mentality, it's not going to happen. The only thing that will happen happen is that we can now operate legally and safely and then we'll have access to the justice system if we are abused. Right now a lot of sex workers don't want to even go to the police if they have been abused because they think what they're doing can get them into trouble and result in legal charges against them. So I do think that it would be productive to discuss the possibility of regulation and licensing although we have to be absolutely sure that it's not so punitive that sex workers end up in a worse situation than we were before. And Ron, as a wrap-up as to where well, you I, see I, things are... I, I totally agree. We need to have further discussion about regulation, both at the uh, provincial and municipal levels. Um, there are a lot of issues um, at stake. You know, uh, I, I, I've heard people, uh, and it's great to have this debate in the context of this court case, but until um, this court case resolves and the Supreme Court of Canada finally um, it, ends the debate on the legality of these three provisions, it's very difficult for the provincial and municipal governments to say, okay, what are the appropriate regulations that we need in place? And we need appropriate regulations to protect the public from a health and safety perspective, because the public obviously has a vested interest, the, the industry has a vested interest, and uh, right now there's, there's no municipal or provincial government that's meaning um, with any of the stakeholders to discuss these issues until the Supreme Court of Canada rules on this case. Sure. Well, today we were with Nikki Thomas and Ron Marzell talking about the um, sex laws in Canada. Nikki Thomas from the Sex Workers of Canada, and Sex Professionals of Canada, excuse okay. me, and Ron Marzell being a prominent lawyer. Um, Stuart Weinstein from Legal Talk, once again in terms of investing, sponsoring, or advertising, we look forward to that as well as we build on the viewership. We'll be talking about other topics of discussion, and coming up in a future episode will be the unemployment epidemic. So I'm Stuart Weinstein. Thank you for joining us today, and this is Legal Talk.